So guys, thanks for coming today. Today I got the honor to wish you a warm welcome to our new office and to open up our QA winter conference. So uh, today I believe that nothing would be that great without our amazing guys who supported this conference and as well as uh, you all who are here today with us. So uh, today uh, you will get the opportunity to listen four of our technical talks driven by our QA experts coming from GD. So we will start with Svetlana Dronikova, our senior QA engineer, which will talk about presentation why, how, what, and what for. After that, we will proceed with Gennady Chursov, who is going to present about the power of mentoring. After that, you will have time for a little break. Uh, then the second half of the conference, we will start with a small quiz and please feel free to uh, join us because you are able to win some prizes. Next talk will be driven by Petr Sharapenko. He's going to talk about how a uh, hoverfly proxy for testing purposes. And last but not the least, Dragan Nikolic, our senior automation QE engineer, who is going to present the topic, how to write good test scenarios. So after all the presentations, you will have the opportunity to speak with our talent acquisition team and to reach out to our engineers and ask some particular questions about the company and everything that seems to be interesting for you. So I believe that we can start, Svetlana. You can join here and you can start with your part. Enjoy. Okay, done. Once more, <laughs> glad to see you, everybody, uh, in this office. And um, uh, that's our first uh, QA Winterfest here uh, in Belgrade in uh, Grid Dynamics, etc. And that's uh, actually the first offline event uh, since COVID related to QA. So we're very glad to participate there. Uh, and um, first of all, uh, I would mention three things. Uh, the first one, it's uh, all questions please ask uh, at the end of presentation. Uh, first, we'll uh, ask offline, then online. Uh, we will uh, say them uh, loudly. Uh, uh, second thing, uh, <coughs> as Sienna mentioned, we'll have Kahoot at the break. Uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll have some QR code for that, so please join. Uh, we have special prizes for winners. Uh, and um, uh, third thing is, um, uh, right, uh, we have four uh, presentations uh, today and we uh, guess some phrase. Uh, we put uh, words at these presentations and put them randomly on the slides uh, per one by presentation. Uh, and uh, you can uh, look them, uh, notice them and um, uh, create the phrase. At the end of all presentations, we will have a Google form there you can, uh, you can fill. Uh, and uh, for three winners who will be the fastest and uh, uh, the right, basically, uh, we'll have some prizes too. We'll have about a minus for that after all. Uh, and after everything, we'll join our meals, uh, drinks, etc. Okay, uh, that's the things I said. And uh, let's start. First of all, I will uh, say a couple of words about our company. Uh, basically, it's, uh, Grid, uh, Grid Dynamics is a leading provider of technologies, uh, consulting. Uh, uh, we have uh, some expertise with custom software development and data analysis. And um, uh, basically, Grid Dynamics been founded in Silicon Valley um, in 2006. Uh, and, um, uh, now it's a uh, spread company uh, based in about uh, 40 countries uh, and uh, union together about uh, uh, 4,000 uh, engineers uh, and it continued to grow. Uh, that's uh, our customers, uh, not the full list, uh, pretty big companies I would say. Uh, and. Uh, we have expertise in such fields like uh, uh, cloud solution, data analysis, um, uh, different platforms for retail and other stuff. Uh, and you can find more information if you don't know yet, it's on our website. Uh, and uh, I think that's it uh, for this short slide. And now let's uh, uh, deeper to presentations. Uh, basically, the first, uh, it's my one about presentations. I know it sounds a bit recursive, right? <laughs> presentation about presentation, but uh, that's something I would to talk today about. And um, uh, basically the topic, why we need presentation, why, how, what, and what for. And um, 
Uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce myself once more. I'm Svetlana Dronikova. I work in grid dynamics for um, uh, almost four years. Basically, four years will be next week. Uh, and um, last year, I helped to prepare it, uh, online tech talks for QAs. I listened to speakers and um, I helped them to uh, make the presentation better uh, uh, from QA perspective or not. Uh, also, I made some internal tech uh, talks earlier. And uh, today, I'm going to share some of my experience. Uh, basically, my presentation is for uh, engineers. Uh, no, that might be not really great speakers, not have uh, a big audience, but it's something I want to mention. Maybe it would be useful. Uh, I believe, uh, anyway, even as an engineer, we are doing a um, presentation um, maybe on even regular uh, daily basis, weekly basis. When we present our features to customer, we may present ourselves on interviews, we may present our companies uh, on interviews, uh, and um, um, basically public speaking, it's uh, another thing to um, do in public, basically. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. Today, uh, I'm going to talk about why uh, can we do public talks, uh, what can we talk about on them, uh, and how to make it best. It's like uh, some uh, piece of advice from my uh, experience that I want to highlight, and the Q&A session at the end. Okay, uh, so why to talk about? Uh, first of all, as an engineer, we have some experience. And um, the first thing that we can do is uh, knowledge transfer. We are professionals. We uh, achieve something and we uh, can uh, provide it to the public to share our experience to maybe uh, our colleagues, uh, our friends, or a uh, wide audience. And um, doing that, we get in recognition. Uh, I believe it's really important in uh, all careers, not only engineers. Uh, when we achieve something, when we uh, uh, doing something with uh, results, uh, good or bad, independently. Uh, we uh, achieve something, we get an acknowledgement. And uh, when we present something, uh, we get an acknowledgement, we became um, recognizable in wire group. Uh, and uh, that's something that I think uh, uh, a great motivator for us. Also, uh, we are building our personal brand as an engineer. Talking about that uh, uh, widely, I would say, it's uh, uh, when uh, you share your great idea to a bigger audience, uh, you again get in recognition, acknowledgement, etc. And um, uh, even if uh, not talking about big audience, we can just edit it into our CV. Our CV grows, uh, we like it, we, everybody likes it, I believe. Okay, uh, next thing, uh, it's um, when you talk about something, about your topic, uh, you understand it better. Uh, it always works for me, and uh, when you describe in your experience, you uh, on the public, you're getting the second view on that and getting feedback. It's um, uh, always useful. Uh, again, <laughs> Two brains, two minds, it's better than one, and it always happens for me, so that's important. Uh, next thing, it's mostly about offline talks like we have today, but uh, we uh, grow in our networks and social networks, uh, and uh, we socializing, especially after COVID, it's really necessary, I believe. Uh, and um, basically, we improving our communication skills. Uh, and finally, we have fun. Uh, <laughs> not sure that it doesn't make sense, uh, anything to do without fun, but it's something we can do, so let's uh, enjoy that together. Okay, uh, let's move on. What to talk about? <clears throat> Again, as I said before, uh, we're doing knowledge transfer. So we can uh, share our uh, experience about successful cases, as well as not really successful cases. I believe it's uh, crucial. Uh, for example, you uh, find out that some technologies uh, work with each other uh, and uh, make your solution faster or uh, more, um, with greater quality. 
And uh, you may find that uh, some technologies doesn't work with each other. And it's also, uh, you find that this was a mistake to use them together. And um, it's a good case to share to public. Uh, it will lead them to not spend time on that. So let's save uh, uh, people time. Okay, uh, besides that, we can um, do overviews, comparison some technologies, uh, and sharing pros and cons on using all that dependent on the requirements you're facing on projects, for example. And um, a while ago, I made um, a talk about device farms. Uh, there was a case uh, on uh, my project that I, uh, then we as a team needed to compare some device farms uh, depending on our requirements. Uh, I bring it to the tech talk and um, actually it was <laughs> useful because even uh, after years some engineers came to me and asked about that again. So I was really surprised uh, about that. So that works as well. Uh, and um, please don't forget that we can share not only technical experience, but also not technical, like soft skills. And um, uh, for example, uh, we can talk about uh, <laughs> how to be a good mentor. That's actually in our next talk. And uh, we can talk about interviews. We can uh, interviews like from company side and employee side, for example. Um, another thing that we can talk about, for example, good examples of uh, managing uh, some soft skills, uh, etc. Uh, nowadays, it's pretty important, I would say, again. Okay, uh, let's move on. Pretty boring slide, we won't uh, keep uh, along there. Uh, how to make uh, presentation best? Uh, for me, I um, uh, selected four points for keeps. Keeping topic, keeping time. Uh, keep it simple and uh, keep alive. So the first keep on topic, like you have an idea and you present this idea. And uh, do not need to talk uh, uh, about uh, everything <laughs> around that. Uh, because it will uh, take time and audience will lose uh, attention. That's not good. Another thing, keep on time. Uh, let's do not uh, take it forever because uh, it's not needed nobody. Keep it simple, uh, I'll talk about this later, but keep alive, we are just uh, humans. Uh, we have some feelings and um, uh, don't, uh, uh, I don't know, <laughs> don't be a robot. <laughs> uh, that's uh, the main thing. About keep it simple, uh, actually when I um, created that, I recalled uh, <laughs> Python Zen principles. Uh, uh, Actually, who familiar with uh, Python then? <laughs> okay, a couple people, <laughs> I will explain. So there are, uh, Python then, it's uh, 19 or tw uh, 20, it depends, uh, uh, principles that Python language follows, uh, but they creation, uh, creators, sorry. And uh, uh, these are just uh, simple sentences about uh, uh, how Python works, basically. And uh, they've been created by Tim Peters. Um, and um, I had not found uh, uh, his picture, so I put here Guido Van Rossum, this is creator of Python. I found a lot of Tim Peters, I'm not sure what exactly Tim Peters. Uh, and um, here I selected only four uh, that uh, relies to presentation. It's keep it better, uh, sorry. Simple is better than complex, uh, complex is better than complicated. If implementation is hard to explain, it's a bad idea. And if implementation is easy to explain, it might be a good idea. Uh, this is uh, a bit clarification in details so how I see this point, uh, keep it simple. Uh, I would suggest use not only in presentation, actually. Okay, then uh, I selected um, how to make it best points on do's and don'ts, on personal and kind of technical, but it, it depends on disputable. Let's talk about uh, uh, personal do's. So first, uh, prepare in advance. <laughs> I know we all been in university. Uh, uh, we can prepare before exam at last night. Uh, we all superheroes here. But um, I think that it's better to prepare in advance. Um, I'll explain why. Uh, when you prepare in advance, you have time uh, to um, look at your um, uh, creation uh, several times. For example, you create a draft. Uh, 
uh, let's say you uh, grab a T, and then uh, you have a second view on that. And uh, it will be another view, and uh, you will give some ideas. You can change it, you can make it best. Another thing, present yourself, because uh, sometimes uh, people are forgetting about that and it's become difficult to understand who's talking to you. Um, know your audience and uh, interact with them. Uh, it's, uh, again, about keeping alive, uh, because, um, well, first of all, know your audience. Uh, if you prepare a tech talk about, uh, let's say, device funds, and um, I, I don't know the example, uh, the main thing that uh, the topic you're talking might be not relevant to your public. Uh, please don't forget about that. Uh, use gestures and hold scene if possible. Uh, again, if possible, because uh, sometimes we have projectors, we have some restricted uh, uh, the whole scene uh, when we can stand and um, uh, other may be prohibited or, or, or break your uh, presenters. And uh, the last but not least here, it's um, uh, make dry runs. Uh, again, practice makes perfect. I like it. And um, uh, for example, in our Yerevan office, we have coffee talks. It's uh, when somebody can uh, create um, the slides, uh, the topic, uh, not actually about uh, some QA stuff or technical. For example, we're going to talk about football there. Uh, it, the main goal there is to practice, and uh, actually I'll talk about this a bit later in don't. Uh, so we'll focus on that later again. Uh, some technical truth. Uh, from my experience, uh, people like to give, uh, uh, to get information from tables, structures, because it's a picture, it's like uh, some colors there, and um, uh, it's uh, understandable. Uh, I like when it's uh, easy to read uh, and um, it's uh, visible, uh, especially about giving some results of something. Uh, then, uh, if you have a big uh, screen, uh, please check your presentation uh, before you present it, because something might be not visible uh, for audience from one corner <laughs> of room or another. Uh, fonts may be unreadable, etc. Uh, also, if you have some abbreviation, please uh, describe it at the beginning. It makes your talk um, clearer. Uh, and uh, <laughs> if you present from your own laptop, please turn on notification because nobody is interested in your personal life, your personal messages, etc. Let's move on. Let's move on to personal don'ts. The first, uh, don't worry, <laughs> be happy. <laughs> Uh, but I know that it's not easy. And, uh, for example, who is not worrying uh, before your presentation? Again, <laughs> I believe the rest is feel something be before that, as well as me, actually. <laughs> and um, uh, that's something I, I left here, haha, <laughs> yeah, easy. But um, uh, that's a point here from my side. So worrying is okay. I know that every musician, Every uh, great speakers uh, are really worried um, about the, uh, his talk or presentation. And that's fine. Again, we're just uh, humans, we're keeping life, right? Uh, and um, uh, that's uh, another thing when worrying become a, a scare of sin. And that's something we can work on. Uh, and uh, it's something that relates with the dry runs from my previous slide. And, um, for example, you were into talking public and uh, uh, try to explain something to your cat, for example, or to your spouse, to your friends, to your parents, etc., to you in the mirror, maybe. And um, it will help you to understand that you can do that. Uh, then, uh, when cat listen to you, uh, try to increase uh, the audience and uh, understand that it's also doable for you. Uh, it's uh, where our coffee talks helps really. And point here, even if people not listening to you, don't worry, because again, we are just human beings. We might be um, interacted by moms calling and we cannot answer that and um, or wife calling, etc. Uh, and um, uh, we might be distracted on a butterfly flying somewhere. And uh, it doesn't mean that people don't listen to you at all. Uh, they will bring something for your presentation. 
Uh, another thing, um, uh, speak too fast or too slow. I think it correlates with worry, uh, and it's also something that you can practice on. Uh, and uh, I think it's difficult, <laughs> but uh, please don't talk very fast or too slow. Um, use many details in your topic. Uh, I think the main idea of presentation give um, um, basically the main idea. Sorry for repeating. And um, given more details uh, um, can make uh, people distracted and they um, will not get anything. Uh, let's uh, they uh, get something and they come back to you with questions. I think that's better than uh, give too many details at once. Uh, and uh, uh, I will talk about the last read your speech because it's something that we bring from school, etc. That it's uh, not um, uh, good. For me, it relates with keeping alive uh, because um, uh, when we're reading, we uh, not only just read, uh, reading it as a robot. Uh, be serious. It's uh, disputable, I think, because it depends on the format of your event. So I'm considering this event is quite informal. So that's why I decided to put these pictures, animation, etc. But it depends when you present something in the huge, uh, uh, in front of the whole your company, it might be different and uh, uh, keep it uh, formal and serious. Okay, uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, one more slide about don't technical. Uh, don't put too much animation. Because uh, it um, uh, it pay, pays attention of audience, and they might lose the main idea of what you're talking about. Another thing, don't let display sleep. It's similar to turn off notification, because um, you've been talking about something. Display will be dark, and um, doesn't matter what you're saying. Or well, it's matter, but <laughs> yeah. Another thing, use uh, caustic calls because. Um, it will distract people. Uh, don't use different slides. Or oh, don't, uh, font style, sorry, different slides, okay. Uh, and um, because it uh, correlates with costing all and too much animation. Uh, and please don't share production data, right? <laughs> we are all engineers, we all sign a lot of docs, so let's keep it legal. Uh, and um, yeah, keep, keep it legal. And that's, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> that is something I bring from uh, Microsoft Word from, uh, <laughs> I don't know, the zeros. And uh, that's something we like at everything at once and enjoy it. Uh, but please don't do that, it distracts as well. Uh, and I think that's it. Let me wrap up this. So I talked today about why to do that. It's um, about sharing your achievements, your uh, expertise. Uh, and uh, doing that, we grow as professional in different directions. Uh, talking about what? Uh, again, uh, as I said, we can share our, ex our experience, uh, do some overviews uh, of, I don't know, books, technologies, etc. And how to make it best? Actually, it's pretty difficult to select only one from what I uh, shown. I selected practice. Practice makes, makes perfect. And that's something we can uh, achieve all together. And that's me. Any, any, any questions? <laughs> any questions? Everything is clear, right? <laughs> any questions online? No? OK. OK, I hope you get something from that. <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to uh, uh, ask to come here. The next speaker is uh, Gennady. So Gennady, please come. OK, hello, everyone. My name is Gennady Chursev. But mm -hmm. if you listen to other QA Fest this year from Grid Dynamics, there was QA Spring, there was QA Autumn. Probably you already saw me. If not, it's completely OK. We can start. And I will tell you about power of mentoring. Uh, a few words about me. I'm working in Grid Dynamics for almost four years. And I'm working more than 10 years in IT at all. 
And in Grid Dynamics, I also work in as quality assurance lead and a mentor, internal and external. And before we will start, I have a simple question for you. Are you recognize yourself as a human? If yes, please raise your hand. I see not everyone recognize your, uh, ourselves like a human, but it's completely okay because our presentation for everyone. And then I will show you that not only humans could be a mentor. Okay, so uh, what about the reasons why I choose that topic? And there are several. Uh, first of all, I'm experienced mentor. For example, I started it uh, two years ago. I performed more than 100 uh, mentoring session. As external mentor, I participated in two student practice inside Grid Dynamics, and I helped more than 20 people. And for current statistic, I have like average three mentoring session per week. So, uh, what will be our agenda for this topic? I will start with my results for almost two years of mentoring. Next, we will discuss who is mentor and what is mentoring. Next, it will be about at which point of career you need a mentor and how to perform good mentoring from my experience. And after that, we will discuss two sides of benefit. First, from mentor side and his mentee, and the last benefit for the company itself. And my achievement for two years of mentoring, it starts with one thing. Like, for my mentees who started mentoring with me, there are several additional updates. Like, for example, one person received his first job in IT company. Two person changed his employer and increased salary. Several people were promoted, one from junior to middle quality assurance engineer, and second from middle to senior quality assurance engineer. Also, I helped a lot with preparation for technical part of interviewing. If you will check my YouTube channel, you probably will find a mock interview and other section. So, and for doing that, I actually started to uploading all my sessions, at least part, part of my session, to a YouTube channel. After that, when I, I don't know, participated in half of my mentoring session, I started thinking about public speaking. And for example, after mentoring, I decided I have enough materials to public speaking and on our QFest, I had several. It started with uh, public speaking about interview process, do's and don'ts. So if you will not solve it, you can check it on Grid Dynamics YouTube channel and etc. Also, I participated in public speaking for educational platforms, for example, for that platforms when you can find a mentor or something like that. Second list of my achievement because it's not enough for one list. I also completed training for mentor, so I now I have a certification. Uh, also, I promoted in my company, for example, several months ago I was just senior quality assurance engineer, now I'm staff quality assurance engineer. I think it's also related that I'm doing mentoring because uh, because of that, I actually increased my soft and technical skills. Also, if you will search me on GitHub, you will probably find my Java course that has more 40 covered topics and lectures. Also, I created guide how to pass Google Cloud Digital Leader Certification exam. It has more than 1,000 views on YouTube. And I know that several engineers from Grid Dynamics actually successfully passed that certification. Uh, Besides that, I joined other professional communities, for example, Women in Tech Global, when I can work as a mentor for girls, women who want to become quality assurance engineers. And because I had a lot of mentoring for a lot of people, I already have a template, for example, with roadmaps for starting career in IT for manual and automation quality assurance engineers. And two of Grid Dynamics engineers, maybe even more, already started mentoring. So if you will start mentoring because I motivated you, you can also raise your hand. Maybe someone. Okay, I see. <laughs> okay, let's move on. So we discussed all my achievements. Probably that's all for today. And 
who is mentor? And I will have one small task for you. You can just close your eyes and think and imagine mentor, what it will be for five, 10 seconds. OK, probably that's enough. For example, for me, it will be not even a human. <laughs> Okay, so it's actually different from person to person, but for me, mentor is someone who could be experienced person who will share you soft or technical skills. It's one way of mentoring. Another one is a teacher who can share knowledge about specific area. Next, it will be a trainer who can give practical tasks and check the results, or it even could be a coach who can help to reach career goals and motivate uh, a whole group of person. Now let's check what actually is mentoring. For me, mentoring is two-dimension behavior and communication. So as a mentor, you will share your knowledge, your experience, soft, technical skills, specific topics, or maybe you will solve the problem with your mentee. From mentee, you also will get <clears throat> new experience, but you also will share your feedback with mentor. And since mentor will receive a new challenge in his life, he also will increase his knowledge. So it should be every time two-way partnership between mentor and mentee. So now let's talk more about when you actually need a mentor. So there is a small list, and actually I started with all that list, even with my own career, because when I just joined Grid Dynamics, I also had a mentor. So at the point of starting career, you can find a mentor who will guide you. Then it could be setting goals. For example, you're already working in a company. Next, when you are working enough, you want to receive a promotion or maybe change your role in the company. Next, it will be specific skill building. For example, you're a quality, uh, manual quality assurance engineer, you want to have specific skills to become automation quality assurance engineer. Or it could be even changing role from just regular contribution to a team role, like team lead role. It also could be needed, for example, when you're changing your company, you need to be at job searching point, you need to be prepared for interview. And maybe it will be like long-term goals, for example, for changing your career at all. Now let's discuss every topic with details, and I prepared beautiful pictures for everything. So first part, starting career. I actually received a lot of requests about starting career and still <laughs> receiving, so there is a lot of demands on doing that. And for doing that, usually I have a template for, I don't know, frequently asked questions and etc. Also for such people who just at starting point, uh, for example, when you just decide in which course you need to take, you also need like some mentor to be able to, uh, I don't know, define uh, which programming language you need to learn, from which what you need to start, for example, from manual quality assurance engineers, or if you have some experience, you can just dive into automation and etc. And also if you're, for example, already working in the company, you sometimes still need a mentor. For example, I had an experience when uh, my mentee already worked in the company and he even had a mentor from his company, but he afraid to ask question his mentor because he thought that some questions will be inappropriate, for example, too easy and every engineer need to know that topic. So he decided to find external mentor to ask somehow like stupid questions from external mentor because he was pretty shy. So it also could be a point. Now we're moving to next and it's more about setting goals. Like you see, like setting goals, it's not the hardest part. You need to achieve all that goals. So all that goals probably should defined, for example, with using smart methodology, like all goals should be actual, all goals you can achieve and etc. So setting goals also required, for example, if you plan in your career changes, for example, you just hired to the company as intern engineer and you want to be a junior engineer. 
So if you will uh, define correct goals, then at some point of career, when you achieve all that stuff, you probably will be promoted. Next part, it's specifically about promotion. So for example, even if you have that goals, you need to behave to be able to reach that goal. So for example, you need to have one-to-ones with your manager and et cetera. You need, I don't know, to write down your goals and achieve a support and approval from your managers that you're going to, for example, uh, move from one goal to another, from one position to another in your company. And for example, when you already assume a new role, you also could have a lot of questions. For example, when I just started uh, being a team lead, I also have a lot of questions, how to behave, for example, how to perform one-to-ones with my subordinate, how to create goal plan and et cetera. So it will be pretty helpful if you will find a mentor who can describe you with details and experience and some examples how to behave in which situation. Now it's more about skill building. It's more like you, for example, know specific requirement for a specific job. For example, as a mono quality assurance engineer, you need to need to know test design, maybe, uh, I don't know, something about postman to write manual test cases for API calls and etc. So if you know requirement, you can find a mentor who already experienced in that topic and that mentor could help you to skill building. So if you want, you can, I don't know, find a specific course on Coursera, plural site or etc. But sometimes that courses doesn't have human behavior and human communication. It's only re written or pre-recorded text. And if you have specific question on specific topic, you can find, I don't know, community with other students, or you can use mentor for doing that. Next is building leadership skills. And it's more about when you wanted to be a leader. So to doing that, you need to increase your soft skills, not focus only on hard skills. So it will be pretty vital to increase in both direction. And for doing that, mentor also could help you. For example, there is a specific uh, trainings to become a team lead. So there is a lot of things to do. I will not tell you exact which because it's a different topic. So we will move on, on job searching. For job searching, I'm receiving actually a lot of requests because no one, <laughs> Uh, like everyone who wants to change a job are facing pretty similar issues. You need to update your CV, you need to apply for a position, then for example you need to be trained to ask common questions and etc. So for doing that we can provide a mock interview. For example, we are providing interviews that pretty imitate the real one with real questions, giving a feedback and then after some time when your mentee will be pretty confident on performing mock interview, he could start actually job searching with real interview because it will be a shame if you, for example, unprepared will go to a company of your dream and fail the interview. Probably you will need to wait at least half a year to try one more time. Next thing is playing career changes. For example, I know a lot of person, people who decided to move, for example, from manual quality assurance to automation quality assurance. And for that reason, you probably need to create a goal plan, like specific steps to achieve your new role. So from manual to automation, probably it contains both technical part and soft skill part, skill building, and etc. For current point, I already have a template for a person, but still you need to be uh, agile and modify your template for specific uh, goals and specific desire and request of your mentee. So we decided uh, at which point you need. Now let's decide what will be a good step for you. And this list starting with define a goal. So first one, you need to uh, listen to your mentee request. For example, some mentee could actually define his current goal. For example, I want to be an automation quality assurance engineer. Some mentee don't even know what they want. For example, I want good salaries, that's all. So 
If you have such requests, you can ask additional questions. Okay, what you prefer, uh, you know, doing manual job or doing automation? Do you know something about programming languages? After that, additional questions, you, for example, could define actual goal of your main team. Next part, it's creating a roadmap of specific steps, but it's more for long-term relationship. For example, it's not only one-to-one -one session once per year, it's one-to-one -one sessions once per one week or maybe twice per week even. So for doing that, probably it will be great if you will create roadmap. So at each point of your mentorship, uh, both mentee and mentor will know at which point you are, what's the next steps, and etc. Then it's more about appropriate style of mentoring. So you need to uh, be also agile if you're working with specific mentee. Then don't uh, afraid to ask feedback, it's actually required. And other topics like give real example from your experience, starting from repeating to developing skills, and for example, when you're building skill set, also it's required to focus not only on hard skills, but soft skills, as already mentioned. And every mentee is different from each other. So like for example, one could have a lot of experience with automation, one could have already experience with programming languages, so it will be good to split difficult topics into easy one, but it depends on your main team. Next part, it's about motivation and encouraging your main team. And the last but not least, checking mental health of your main team. Because if it's long term, probably there could be some issues. Now let's discuss it in more details. Like starting with defining goal, as already said, you need to listen to your team. And sometimes, uh, if your mentee doesn't know what he want, you can uh, know, uh, tell about your success, like your example, how, for example, I became a quality assurance engineer, how my friends, co-workers from your company became quality assurance engineers. But also, you need to mention not only good side, but, for example, issues that was for you. For example, for me, becoming a quality assurance engineer was pretty hard way because it was a long time ago and there was no such courses to, you know, became a quality assurance engineer from zero to hero for uh, six months and etc. So I read a lot of documentation uh, courses and etc. So now from a current perspective, I know which courses, which documentation will be better to understanding for a newcomer and could advise that. Next part, creating a roadmap for long-term relationship. If you will Google, for example, roadmap to QA automation engineer, you probably will find one roadmap, maybe 100 roadmaps. But it's also required that every roadmap that you will find in internet or you will create by your own will uh, apply for your specific requirements of your mentee. So it should be one roadmap for everyone. It could differ from one to another. So it will be better that it will be flexible. Next part is choosing appropriate style of mentoring. And we can return back when I told that mentor could be just mentor, teacher, coach, and trainer. So it also depends what you wanted to achieve. For example, if the goal only to prepare for interview, it's more like mocking interviews or you're working like a trainer, you're asking questions, doing homework, and checking it. For example, if you are working with already motivated engineer who, for example, senior position, and he need to acquire specific skill set, you could be, I don't know, only a mentor. So he already knows how to achieve it. He just need additional support and just uh, look from other side. So it depends. You need to choose your specific option for your mentee, but also you need to know that uh, if you choose a specific style, after some time, it could be another style because, for example, when you're starting with hard skills, it could be, for example, just uh, training. Then for soft skills, it could be, for example, more coaching. So it depends. Next is about asking feedback. So asking feedback should be required from both sides. Mentor should ask feedback from mentee. Mentee should ask feedback. First of all, it will keep you in actual position. For example, all your goals will be at the point of actuality. So 
every goal is for now actual. And if you're receiving feedback, you, for example, may know, for example, if your style appropriate for, it, for your Minty or not. So you can adjust your settings for a specific Minty. Next one, it's more about giving real example from your experience. For example, when I'm defining some problem, issues, context, and etc., it will be great if you will give real examples. For example, real tasks that could be happen when you will be a junior engineer in a real, real company. But <laughs> you also need to be aware to not share confidential information. So you cannot just copy paste the code from your current project and share it with your mentee, even though it will be one-to-one -one session and he will didn't tell anyone, still it's confidential, so you don't need to do that. Next is for skill building, when you're starting from repeating to developing skills. For example, uh, when you're starting to teach someone something, usually I'm starting with a part when I'm showing how I'm doing the task. Then, next stage, you're giving that task to your mentee, he's doing the job, and you're just looking at every step and giving advice, or for example, if you're doing mistake, you can add some resolution or add some explanation. And at the last point, your mentee will do all the task and you will check only the results. And the same for every developing skills. You're starting from your experience and you're ending that your mentee could solve the problem and you will just say, okay, good job. Ne next time we will do something else. Uh, next, you're focusing not only on hard skills, but both soft skills. It means like, for example, if you're working even with junior engineer, probably in the real world he will need some communication stuff. So, for example, he needs to be able to search, uh, communicate with customer, communicate within the team, ask good questions, and etc. So, for doing that, you can imitate the real process of a real company. For example, when you are giving a task to your mentee, you could, for example, skip some important information and ask mentee to Google it firstly. And if he will not find the question or the answer, you will give additional information. Or, for example, you can try another role. For example, you are working as project manager. You are giving task without any explanation. So your mentee should return back to you and ask additional questions. Next part is splitting difficult topics into small, easy to understand. So it shouldn't be like in that picture, <laughs> but pretty similar. So uh, for example, when we are uh, speaking about difficult topic, for example, when you're just manual quality assurance engineer and you want to be automation, probably programming skills could be hard for you. So you can start with something simple. Usually we're starting with just hello world and we're increasing difficulty time to time. But if something will happen, we can revise information. So for doing that, it will be great if you will do homework for your Minty. And also it will be great if you will add additional sources of information. Okay. <laughs> now let's continue. So uh, that's all. Next part is about motivation and encouraging your mentee. So it will be important and even vital if your mentee will receive a good feedback from you. For example, if he's doing great, you need to mention it. If you're doing not so great, you also could mention it. But for example, you can use uh, some specific uh, techniques to doing that. First, you need to focus on a good stuff. Then you can add some additional notes about what he's doing not so great and finish it with great sentence. For example, I'm trusting you, everything will be fine, you will find a solution. If not, I will be there for helping you. And the last, it's checking mental health. So I had a situation, for example, when my mentee disappeared, he stopped doing a homework and etc. For such reason, you can find a reason or be, I don't know, understandable for such situation. For example, if we have a long-term relationship and our goal plan is for, I don't know, six months and we stuck at some point, it will be better to check uh, mental health. I don't know, it could be a lot of issues. You can be supportive. You can ask about additional stuff. So doing that, it 
will be pretty great if you will have even sometimes friendship conversation with your mentee, not only as a mentor and a student. Okay, uh, now we are talking about why to start mentoring. And please raise a hand who already participated in the role of mentor. Okay, I see like almost half of people already been a mentor. Okay, maybe you know why you started it, but for me, it's several reasons. For example, at some point of my career, I wanted to increase my hard skills, coding skills, and etc. And there were several reasons. For example, I want to be prepared for interview to another company or, or a project inside my company. Or I also want to be prepared to be an interviewer inside the company. So it's a good point to increase the hard skills. And it's also a good point to increase soft skills because you're not only learning Java, you also need to explain difficult topics to another person with simple words. I already described, like you need to split difficult topics into small ones, so it will increase your communication skills, representation, presentation skill, and etc. So it's good to do in that. And also providing feedback is vital for every team. So as a quality assurance lead and uh, manager, I'm providing feedback inside my company and for my mentees. After that, when you will be pretty confident and it will be like the reason why you could start it. Before that, for example, when you have a lack of some knowledge, you could think of yourself like, I'm just a regular engineer, no one will listen to me, no one will follow my guidance and etc. But after, I don't know, maybe 10 mentees will listen to you or no, will find your course pretty good. So it will increase your confidence. And increasing and boosting your confidence also will affect your current job in your company. For example, for me, it will lead to a new position inside Grid Dynamics. Next thing is about networking. So you will find the new mentees. And since I joined another communities, for example, women in tech and et cetera, I found another lot of people who also doing mentoring who are from quality assurance or from tech and IT itself. So you can find a lot of other people who can share knowledge with you or you can share knowledge with them. So it will be your new audience. And for example, if your mentee is pretty good and he need to find a new job, you can also refer this person to your company and for some company for example for grid dynamics if you're referring someone you also could achieve a bonus so it's additional money for you it's also good to have but you also could earn money and income even from mentoring itself for example mentoring as external mentoring could be even paid version so you can I don't know doing that for free for example I'm doing free lessons for uh, women in tech but for other, uh, my mentoring, it could be even paid, so you can earn additional money, income, and etc. And for a lot of topics that I discuss with my mentees, some of that knowledge gained converted into public speaking, as already mentioned. For example, I prepared public speaking about uh, technical interviews, do's and don'ts. If you subscribe to Grid Dynamics channel, probably already saw it. If not, you can just rewatch it. And the last possible benefit for the company. So as a mentor inside Grid Dynamics, I'm doing a lot of stuff, uh, especially for Grid Dynamics people. Like for example, this year I became specialization lead. It's like junior position for engineering manager. So I'm working with engineers inside the company and helping with growing. Also, you can do it as a part of your re regular routine job. For example, if you have a junior on your uh, specific project, you can help him, for example, also share knowledge about specific tools and etc. And for example, for my project, I created a, lo a lot of knowledge training about specific tools, so it's also good. Other thing, like for referring mentees, it's like two-dimensional benefit. Mentor will receive a bonus, company will receive a new employee. Beside that, uh, if you will work in the company, you also could create a, some kind of community inside your company. For example, I started creating a community of public speakers and people who are start working as mentors. And for doing that at the internal company level, first you gain a new society, new community where you can 
uh, learn and teach from each other. And then it's also increasing uh, you know, public brand of yourself and the company. And performing public speaking like right now. And I also prepared uh, public speaking uh, for previous quality assurance fest and I hope I will also be a uh, public speaker for next session. Also increasing hard soft skills of a mentor, it's a good stuff, so company don't need to provide additional training. I could do it by my own and I also could share my knowledge of that trainings and etc. even without the team and in, without the company. And since I'm working from mentees from other companies, for example, uh, from Belgrade, from other countries around the world, uh, we can share some additional knowledge for specific uh, internal structure of the companies. I hope not, not confidential information, but for example, if we have several approaches to testing something, several approaches of studying something and etc. We are sharing that knowledge and for example I could uh, learn from someone from another company and apply that knowledge into my company and he could do vice versa. So we are sharing the knowledge and we are just getting stronger. So probably that's all and before we will end uh, another one hands, raising hands. So who wants to become a mentor after that presentation? Yeah, yeah, several. Okay. So this is my contact. If you want to find me, you also could find me in network session today. And any questions? Okay. No, I just want to ask you. Some circle, some Okay. Sorry. Um, so I, I just want to ask you regarding the senior QA engineers. Yep. Um, how, what kind of trainings uh, or courses you are uh, conducting and you are giving that, that is crucial for their development? So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just some recommendation. Okay. Not, not only recommend. when we're talking about the hard skill as well as soft skills. Yeah, we started with hard skills. For example, the first request was to change a job and receive a promotion from middle to senior. Now he has another request. He wanted to uh, be uh, promoted uh, higher and also to change his country from, I don't know, Serbia to United States of America. So he need to know which process of hiring into that area. He need to be prepared with mock interviews and etc. And he sometimes also has issues on his current project. He, he just need to a second point of view on the issue, for example. We both experienced enough and we can share our ideas. For example, something like that. But for example, some courses, um, you're, I suppose that you're using Udemy or some online Yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, if I could recommend some courses, it's more about skill building. For example, if senior wants to have a, a specific skill set, he could ask me, okay, which course you could recommend for you know, learning Java and I could send him a link or it could be separate, it could be like I'm just sending a link or we can work together for example he has some issue on a project and he wants to have a solution. Usually I'm not giving exact solution, I'm helping him to be able to solve the issue by herself so I'm not uh, coding uh, for everyone who just want to be uh, a mentee so I'm helping to uh, achieve the knowledge to be able to solve the issue. Anything else? Hello, so uh, I want to know if a mentee has some issues that they don't like your style of mentoring. How do you handle those situations? Okay, so I can change my style. So at the first uh, mentoring session, I'm asking my mentee uh, about how we are going to plan our uh, mentoring sessions. We can start with something like regular for everyone. Then I'm asking about feedback. Also because I have some recorded session on YouTube, usually I'm sending that YouTube uh, link to my mentee so he already knows how it's uh, usually doing from my side. And if he has some questions, he can, for example, okay, we're working together but I want more practical tasks. He's just asking about that and we're working on that. So. It depends on specific request from Minty. Okay. Uh, so when is the best uh, time to start to be a mentor in, in someone's career? 
I know uh, who became a mentor uh, like from junior to middle position. So if you already experienced enough and something, you already could be helpful. So if you're a strong junior or middle engineer, you can help an engineers who want to be an inter or junior. So it's already enough. It's pretty the same for public speaking. If you're just a junior engineer, you already have several topics, like for example, how you became a quality assurance engineer, how you uh, became a junior position, how you're working to be promoted to middle engineer. It's pretty the same for mentoring <coughs> also. You already have experience and you can share it. So it depends on the topic you want to... It depends on the topic, but you, you can mentor. start from junior plus middle position. Okay. Anything else? Do we have uh, questions from Zoom? I have one. Yeah. Um, thank you for a great presentation. So I was wondering, um, as a mentee, especially an external one, um, how to avoid breaching the NB NDA and you know not talking about confidential information, especially when uh, learning uh, about some hard skills, not soft ones. Yeah, yeah. So you can search typical tasks, and it's not enough probably. So you can use your project, but for example, you need to delete every customer information. For, for example, previously I had a topic about microservices. So how you can work with microservice architecture for RESTful uh, application. Firstly, I done it on a customer project. Then I needed to delete all information about it and to perform a public speaking in general. So it's pretty the same for your mentee, for example. You have a task from your project. You can delete everything that related to your customer and give it just an example of general knowledge. That's all. Thank you. I'm super curious about your mentors. So the people who mentored you and maybe if you could share some Advi advice that was so great that you you know keep in mind and also uh, tell your mentees like from when I was a mentee for someone yeah yeah when you were mentored by someone yeah mentor or mentee when you were the mentee okay I was mentee in grid dynamics four years ago it was on my first project and actually uh, before that, I had experience only with C Sharp and Java, and I had a project with JavaScript. So I didn't know anything about JavaScript. I found a mentor, so he provided me information, what is JavaScript, and created roadmap for me. So it was pretty enough to start. So I know, okay, this Google link I need to read, then prepare some topics to discuss with my mentor. We, we had one-to-one -one session each, one, each week, and he gave me practical tasks. So it's uh, needed to be done before. So it keep me in a pace, so I need to do something. So beside my current work, I need also to prepare something for my mentor. And then, for example, if I have an issue, I could ask mentor to help me something. But it was the same that I did uh, with my mentees, for example. You're not giving exact solution. You're giving only topics to will help you to find solution itself. So I think it's most important because if you will give just solution, it will be only one time offer. Like you will help and then he will have another issue in five minutes. So you need to uh, keep in growing of your mentee. So your mentee should become you after some time. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay, I think that's all. If you will have other questions, I be here. So, and also we have additional announcement. Like in probably 15 minutes there should be a food, and also we will have a quiz. And for winning in quiz we have special prizes. So keep tuned and. Thank you for attending this topic. There is one question online. Ah, okay. Let me read it. So, uh, uh, how do you create roadmap for your mentee? Okay, for creating roadmap, first part, for example, my mentee want to be an automation quality assurance engineer. I'm just Googling what's the requirement for automation engineers. For example, I found 10 vacancies. I'm getting all the results from my vacancies and creating the most common one. For example, Java programming languages, UI and API, I don't know, something with 
SQL, and etc. So we are creating the most common technologies, the most common skills, and etc. for that specific role. And then for each requirement, we are finding a solution, for example, how to acquire that skill. It could be a course, it could be a practical task, it could be a pet project. We are defining that, for example, in Google Documents. It has deadlines for specific cases. For example, if we wanted to become quality assurance engineer in six months, we need to have a priority for our task. For example, Java programming knowledge uh, will be high priority. API testing also will be high priority. But for example, something about cloud technology will be only second priority, and etc. And after some time, I already created templates for that roadmaps. So for each new mentee, I don't need to create it from scratch. But for example, if he has specific request, I cannot additional information, modify, or change my template. So probably that's all from roadmap perspective. OK, probably that's all. If you will have additional questions, I will be here. OK, hello, everyone. I think you are ready for some technical presentation right after this Kahoot. OK, and here is one for me. Uh, my topic today is uh, Hoverfly proxy for testing purposes. Here we go. Let me introduce myself. My name is Petr Sharapinka, and I'm working here in uh, Grid Dynamics for two years and in Quality Assurance for four plus years, something like this. Okay. Um, I like testing, I like programming, that's why quality assurance and automation is for me. And here is uh, the topic on, on this. Okay. Let's talk about agenda. Uh, so I, I will explain uh, problems we had on our, pro on our uh, project. So I believe that everyone faced them. <laughs> okay, I, I will explain the solution. I will uh, talk about uh, possible solutions uh, that we have to choose um, to think of their pros and cons and so on. Uh, then I will talk about the actual solution, Hoverfly. I will explain its pros and cons, maybe some uh, tricky sites and so on. And uh, finally, troubleshooting and hints, uh, it's uh, some useful information in case you would like to work with this software. Okay, go on. So what problem did we have? Uh, we had uh, environmental problems. Okay, uh, in our audience, uh, who had uh, in the past any kind of uh, environmental pro problems and so on. Okay, there, there. Oh, <laughs> quite a lot. Well, I think it's, it will be useful. So, what did we have here? Okay. Um, in case we have some application we test, um, it, it's uh, placed on some host machine. Um, I believe that some of you have uh, some testing framework and so on, and it uh, executes tests under this application. And here is the most awful site, it's test environments. They are never okay, as from my experience. Also, there is a uh, company network. You see, sometimes it's not working too. Okay, and what problems do we have here? Um, okay, different environments, they are expected to be pretty the same, but uh, they have, uh, each uh, environment have its own uh, database. And people are executing their tests, they are modifying the data in it, so in each single moment, there could be different data in all these databases. And this is uh, lead, and this leads uh, to the inconsistency in it. So on one environment, your test uh, may pass. On another, it may fail. It's very flaky. So 
Uh, and here another problem it's that services uh, can be unavailable on one environment and that's why your test will fail. Um, so in some situation it can be outdated or even not developed by developers. So do you know the situation when you have to test uh, your application service and so on, but it's not even developed yet. So we faced these issues too. And some networking uh, problems, like uh, something being disconnected and so on. Um, someone ca came and he disliked that uh, network cable and turned it off. Okay, let's talk about some possible solutions. So here are some basic solutions to this topic. Uh, let's think of it like, okay, Guys, let's allocate more engineers. That simple solution, it came to your mind actually the first. And do, uh, can we even achieve uh, the solution of this problem with uh, this solution? Uh, sorry. Uh, it's hard to achieve because uh, there are also people, they make mistakes and uh, maybe it will not help at all because they will be fixing manually database, so even use some automation scripts and so on, but uh, finally, everyone will be using these environments. Okay, th the second solution, deploy an independent uh, test testing environment here yeah, for, uh, for each execution, something like that. Oh, th that looks really good, yeah? because we'll have some independency from these environments um, and each test run will be independent. We'll have some uh, test set, uh, you know, set up that will be always the same. Your test will be repeatable, great. But what about the costs? Uh, so this is uh, some cone of this solution because uh, we'll have to spend more money, more time to hire people that are proficient in it and so on. And the last solution uh, I would suggest, it's more an application interactions. So what does it mean? Uh, using our um, test framework, we create mocks, uh, not stops, or maybe stops, let's see later, uh, and uh, make these uh, test executions uh, atomic. It's uh, pretty similar to the previous solution, but uh, it's, it's a different approach. And the cost is uh, also different. So it increases the actual amount of work for engineers who are, who are actually developing auto tests and so on. So, Let's uh, continue to mocking, stabbing, and service virtualization. Uh, who is confident about uh, the difference of these three? Uh, raise your hand, please. Okay, so. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, let me uh, tell you about this. Okay, this is pretty simple, actually. Um, learn that uh, stabs, it's... Uh, about some candid uh, answers for your application. And no logic is involved into answering. So mocks are more about uh, pre programmed response to the application. So there is some logic to match your actual request. And then there is service virtualization. Uh, it's a bit confusing, but it's uh, the same uh, to stops and mocks. It's about uh, making uh, an out of process uh, stops of mocks. Uh, what do I mean? I mean that, uh, for example, uh, your mocks or stops may be a part of your testing repository. And uh, service virtualization is uh, creating something um, that is um, isolated from your testing framework. It's not a part of your code, you launch some separate standalone application and so on. Uh, here you can see a QR code. Uh, there is a great uh, article about it. You can scan it. Oh. 
So, okay. Um, what to choose? How to mock your application? Or how to make a stop? Um, any of you are familiar with uh, Charles uh, proxy or maybe Fiddler? Raise your hand. Okay. Oh, great. This is actually advanced technique. Nice. Oh, I, I think that will be available on online format and so on. Okay, go on. Um, Charles Proxy, Fiddler Proxy, it's uh, some solutions uh, for proxifying data from your application. Okay, Wiremock is a kind of uh, solution for mocking, stabbing, and so on. Uh, it's uh, written on Java. And you can interact with uh, great wrappers, uh, wrappers uh, run them from your testing framework. Awesome. And there is Hoverfly. It's uh, uh, the topic of our of my presentation today. Uh, it's a standalone application. It's a, some sort of uh, out of process mocker stab service virtualization. I've talked on the previous slide. Okay, let's com compare with them. Uh, Charles, uh, okay. All of them are cross-platform. You can install them either on Linux, Mac, uh, Windows. That's great. So it can capture requests and uh, responses from your application. That actually what we need in our tests. We need to uh, ensure uh, ensure that uh, our application works correctly. Then what we need to uh, we need to isolate our application from that flaky environment. And that's why we need to do simulating uh, our environment for our application. So that our application will think that uh, it communicates to, to the real environment. But it's not that. Okay. And uh, you can do simulation with Wiremock and Horrorfly. In Charles Proxy, probably it's uh, possible, but that's not that convenient. Okay, integrating with test frameworks, it's uh, also the pros of Horrorfly and Wiremock. Um, Charles Prox Proxy is uh, probably a standalone application, so it's uh, very convenient for manual testing, but integrate with, test with testing framework, I believe not. Uh, open source solution licensing you, you need uh, some sort of license to run Charles Pro Proxy or Fiddler or another solution like that. But Firemock and Hoverfly are open source. You can uh, inspect its code, uh, ensure it's safe for your company, and so on. Uh, additional software required. Uh, what I mean like... Uh, uh, setting that criteria. Um, in case you run Charles Proxy, you have just a binary or exe file uh, to install it and everything goes, everything is okay. But in case we install Wiremark, it's part of a testing framework and it has a dependency of Java. So you need to install some version of Java on your machine to run this. And in case uh, of Hoverfly, it's only a binary file, exe or something like that for special um, operating system, so we don't need uh, any additional software. Okay, so from that perspective, we have chosen Hoverfly because it uh, has the most pros for our project. Uh, here is uh, what it allows. Uh, also, there is a QR code. You can check it on GitHub and so on. Okay, uh, what I said previously, it uh, can capture traffic, it can simulate traffic, it can do uh, these things uh, at the same time, actually. Um, it can manage, uh, help to manage uh, your simulation and capturing data more uh, easily. And uh, it can run on various platforms. It doesn't need compiling. You can download binary and install it on your machine. Okay, uh, with this solution, you also can simulate uh, network errors and latency. Uh, this could be helpful for some sort of your test uh, where you would like to evaluate uh, the actual behavior of your application in these situations. 
So, there are a lot of uh, actual mods for Hoverfly, but uh, today we'll talk about only these two, Capture and Simulate mod. Okay, I'll let's deep dive uh, into it. So, uh, briefly I will uh, remind we are uh, solving our problem uh, of uh, buggy and uh, failing environments by isolating tests. So, uh, and this uh, needs uh, to be clarified, uh, two terms, proxy server, web server. Uh, are you familiar with that? Uh, do, do you know uh, what's the difference between proxy server and web server? Raise your hand, please, who knows? Mm -hmm. Not so many, let me explain you. Um, uh, actually, Hoverfly can work on those two modes. Uh, the first one, web server, it's used for simulations. And it's uh, when your server responds with uh, actual information or data, it uh, executes uh, some logic on it, and then it provides uh, some actual answer. A proxy server just uh, provides um, a request or response to another endpoint, and it uh, actually doesn't analyze anything. Okay, go on. Uh, what if we want to capture data? It's actually the first step uh, before simulating it. We need to know what actually our application sends to this buggy environment. So then we need to capture our data uh, on some port, etc. So we are uh, setting our host machine to provide uh, application or we can okay, make our application to send traffic uh, via uh, proxy server. Depends on what uh, OS you are running. So, and then it, uh, it, it actually works like uh, application sends real requests and uh, receives actual responses from your buggy environment, but you um, can then dump all this captured data and examine it. After that, uh, you receive that data and you make some preparations for simulating. Actually, it's uh, the same sort of files. Uh, you can actually use them, but uh, you may need some uh, sort of uh, preparations like uh, make uh, differ some responses, uh, remove some IDs, headers that are technical and so on. Let's move on and see how simulating is done. Ha, huh. see, there is nothing, nothing buggy on this side. Uh, so nothing will uh, make our uh, test fail because of network, because of some environment and so on. That's because we have our application contacting a Hoverfly web server that uh, handles its uh, requests and provides responses from its memory, from JSON files uh, with uh, captured uh, requests and uh, responses. So that helps to isolate our application. So, but we want more. Uh, what do I mean? I mean that uh, we want to capture data and uh, simulate at the same time. Why? Uh, our uh, application is changing. We would like uh, to know what's actually sent to our um, environment and what goes back. So uh, that's, that means we want to capture and then we want uh, our application work uh, without uh, environment. So we need to simulate at the same time. Here is the two uh, ways as I understand uh, that uh, uh, how we can do it uh, together, all simultaneously. First one is uh, recommended on um, Hoverfly uh, GitHub. Uh, I had to uh, deep dive into issues and uh, learn how to uh, do it at the same time. Uh, the developer suggested to uh, chain Hoverfly instances. I will show you how it works later. And then uh, you can use some sort of middleware. What is middleware in terms of Hoverfly? Middleware is uh, some sort of uh, third-party application. It may be your script 
or even a web server that dumps uh, data or do some uh, calculations and so on. So we can capture these uh, requests and response pairs um, while simulating using this middleware, actually. So chaining instances, what do I mean? Uh, on the same machine, we can launch as many Hoverfly instances as we want. We just need to uh, launch them on different ports. Or even we can launch uh, Hoverfly instances on another um, uh, host, but it's out of our scope now. Um, so we have our application. It uh, communicates with our Hoverfly proxy. It do the same as on previous slides. It dumps our captured data. We can grab it and handle in testing framework. And there is also an instance of uh, Hoverfly web, web server that simulates uh, the behavior of our uh, testing environment and different services like, uh, you know, okay, cloud logging, like authorization, translations, many others. Okay, go on. Um, so, here we have a more simple solution, but it's uh, like uh, some sort of hack. Um, here we have uh, application under test, then we have uh, Hoverfly web server, and then we need to create some simple Python, Java, or another script. Uh, there, there are some languages that are supported by Hoverfly to be executed. And then um, it will dump uh, captured data for us. It's very similar. Okay, let's uh, go on to troubleshooting and hints. I will uh, give my some advices about working with Hoverfly. Okay, it, uh, it's a standalone application and uh, uh, its, log, uh, um, uh, its logs are not provided on some testing framework uh, you are used to work with. So in case you are doing this manually, it's also like headless and you do not receive logs or anything. So in case you need uh, hoverfly logs and errors, there is this command and provides a great output so you can check it and see what happened uh, during simulations or capturing data. I also uh, suggest verifying uh, simulation files that, uh, that they can be uh, compiled or checked by some sort of JSON um, checkers. I don't know <laughs> how to call this uh, sort of software. Um, then I would suggest you, in case you are using um, Hoverfly in your testing frameworks, add some sort of weights uh, to using uh, your application. This will help uh, to avoid the situation when your um, software uh, is executing some program uh, and it uh, calculates the output. It takes time, maybe milliseconds or even smaller, I don't know. And uh, then um, your testing framework asks Hoverfly if there are some answers from your application, but uh, no, not enough time uh, have gone, so you need to wait. Just wait uh, for maybe 30 seconds and uh, uh, ping Hoverfly each uh, second, like if it had results, so no. Okay, also there is a useful feature called destination filtering uh, in case you would like to receive uh, only Splunk logging results in your application, you can use it. So uh, in case you are using Windows, uh, a system proxy could be set and you are testing something, uh, each results are coming through this Hoverfly instance and uh, like uh, you are Googling something, there are some additional services asking for requests. And uh, then you would like to receive only requests and response from Splunk. And that's all. Uh, okay, uh, there is uh, various matchers. It's strategies to match your requests. 
it's about the logic uh, in um, in requests uh, that handles hoverfly it decides if this particular request uh, applies to it or just to skip it uh, in case you want to simulate something uh, and there are different uh, uh, matchers for that uh, what actually this matcher do um, this matcher uh, provides uh, some sort of uh, searching via this request and uh, for example you have some kind of ID in your request and every time you, exec you execute your application it, it's different so but you need to match this because it's, uh, it has some maybe uh, uh, letters in it uh, or you just need to check that it, it's uh, made by, by some pattern. You can use regex. Uh, you also can use uh, JSON XPath matchers. It uh, checks even the whole JSON file in your request or response. Okay, and there is also middleware. You can also use this uh, not just to dump or save uh, the results uh, of capturing data. You, you can use it whenever you want. Uh, you can simulate latency with it. You can simulate networking problems by some randomizing and so on. But I think randomizing is not that good solution. But in case you want to simulate, uh, you know, faulty uh, behavior of your application, you can use this middleware and uh, start some Python script that will fail interaction with it. Uh, interaction with it. Okay. Uh, summary. So what? What did we do? We isolated uh, our test execution from unstable environment. Oh, <sighs> you can breathe now. <laughs> uh, you can uh, check and verify applications, requests, and responses in automatic manner. So you don't need to use uh, Charles or Fiddler uh, by your hand and do this manually all the time. It can be automated. So. What else? Easily prepare and manage environment test data. Uh, actually, uh, Hoverfly provides uh, some syntax uh, where you can grab a lot of your uh, captured JSON files and merge it into one. You, you, doesn't need, uh, you don't need to uh, okay, do it manually, but just providing the names to this uh, CLI um, command and uh, it will do everything for you. So simulate service services, okay? Um, you can simulate uh, any version of your service for in, in the particular test. You can create some responses that are um, from some contracts you have um, from some requirements and so on when the service is not developed yet. And you can simulate networking issues. Uh, that's additional field for testing. So that's all from my side. Um, I want to know if you have some questions. I would like to answer them. Uh, okay, I, I would like to mention that the best, uh, the best uh, question will be uh, priced. So we'll, we'll decide if there is a winner. Okay, I have a question. So you described <laughs> okay, uh, JSON validation no. and also when you can simulate networking issue. Could we use Hoverfly proxy specifically for contract testing and child testing? Uh, yeah, of course, sure. Uh, in f uh, first, uh, in case you want uh, contract testing, uh, you can specify your request responses in some simulation file or you can uh, have some expectation, yeah, contract, and then capture request response. And that would be a part of your uh, contract okay. testing, yeah. And then some chaos testing, I believe that's uh, some sort of task for uh, middleware that will fail for some reason and you can examine behavior of your application in that particular case. Yeah, thank you. Okay, there was uh, also a question there. 
Thank you. I just want to, uh, to clarify, uh, does that mean that we can run our tests offline? Uh, repeat, please, the last phrase. Uh, can we run our tests offline, meaning without internet connection? Yeah, sure, because uh, I, I've showed the slide. Uh, my previous, let me, ah, okay, even this. Uh, see, there is no uh, network at all. So yeah, you can pro you can execute these tests online or even in your infrastructure that's uh, that is out of you know access to the big web to the internet. And so. do we need some help from developers to set up this Solarfly? I believe no. Uh, you know the, there is uh, a good documentation from Hoverfly, and uh, quite easy examples are there. So you need just uh, you know a couple of hours, maybe minutes, just <laughs> to get used to it. Depends on your level, actually. It's very easy. It's very well documented. And even if you have some tricky cases, uh, I will recommend you to check uh, GitHub issues. Probably um, there, there are some solutions. Okay, because that, that's uh, great about open source projects. Uh, we have a lot of information. And we also can ask our own questions on GitHub and so on. And sorry, one more uh, short thing. Uh, can we run par parallel tests on Hoverfly? Oh, uh, I believe yes. Uh, you can uh, start uh, a lot of instances of Hoverfly on your PC or server and so on, uh, you can even start them on other nodes in your mm, okay, computing network. And uh, you can link your test uh, with uh, these instances and execute them in parallel. Okay, it could okay, be parallelized. Thanks. Additional questions? <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding uh, appliance, how we, uh, how we, um, how we can use it, or can we use it uh, for UI testing? I, I got that we can test, uh, we can do API testing, but what about UI testing? Mm -hmm. Can we replace our data on the UI side uh, that we're getting by API? and just replace it by Hoverfly and test our UI. Okay, I got your question. Uh, well, good question though. Uh, I've never th thought of it actually, but uh, I think yes. Uh, since uh, Hoverfly is, uh, uh, has web server mode, mm -hmm. uh, and so you can somehow initialize uh, interaction with it, uh, with testing framework, maybe you can do it, actually. So you, you will need to um, grab this uh, data and, okay, capture the initial uh, request to your server and uh, then provide this application. So uh, this application actually could be even a browser. So you can provide uh, some settings for proxifying there and it will ask uh, a web server on another host or an another port, yeah? And th there could be a Hoverfly instance there, so you uh, just uh, downloading resources from it. Yeah, that's really nice, thank you, thank you. Okay, great. Any other questions? Online question, great. Uh, okay, so uh, where is such an application located if it's not online? I believe ah. it's back to previous questions. Ah, great. Uh, I've mentioned uh, two ways where you can, uh, you know, deploy this application. It could be even on your computer for testing, or in case it's uh, isolated from any network, uh, you have no choice. It, ha it has to be on your computer. And uh, in case you have some isolated network, local network or your organization network, uh, you can leverage this solution and uh, place Hoverfly on some another nodes. It, it a bit, it's a bit tricky, I think, 
so but more okay uh, proficient solution maybe to parallelize tests and uh, make executions on another nodes other than your laptop maybe is it clear uh, okay we have another yeah. uh, online I I believe it's answer to your answer. Uh, how does this actually help us uh, eliminating the environment? We need to test separately if connections to database, etc., to see if they are working. That seems like more work rather than less. And um, if run on local on your laptop, how do you handle builds in versioning? Oh, there are two questions actually. <laughs> uh, okay, let's start from the first one. Uh, you are um, talking about uh, integration testing, when we, we are uh, testing our integrations uh, uh, with uh, some databases and so on. Um, okay, uh, Hoverfly is more about uh, contract testing, uh, when you are checking interfaces uh, and so on. And when you need uh, to know that uh, the whole system is working great and uh, all the data comes for your app application, network, and uh, further, um, I think that's uh, some level of, um, you know, uh, system testing or end-to-end -end testing. So uh, that's not the purpose of Hoverfly. Uh, it's more about uh, lower level testing integration and so on. And the second question, please remi remind me. So if run on local on your laptop, how do you handle builds and versioning? How do you handle builds and versioning? Okay, in case you are using Git, that's obvious solution, it's uh, uh, you, you somehow need to uh, connect to a network uh, to synchronize, yeah? But it's, uh, in case you have no network at all, um, I believe you can uh, bring on some external storages <laughs> your data and so on. <laughs> uh, then uh, about VPN, uh, this is quite a tricky topic, you know? Uh, because uh, interacting with uh, VPN and uh, proxy server, uh, it's a great question, actually. Uh, I'm not that clear about uh, how it interacts. There is not so many information on the internet. I actually using my laptop uh, uh, using VPN, and uh, I actually uh, execute tests with Hoverfly proxy and so on. And as for me, uh, Proxy stands before VPN, so uh, that means that uh, uh, at first you are interacting with Hoverfly, web server, or simulating, or proxy, and then there is uh, your VPN solution, it's about networking. So it was uh, cut off in the middle of presentation. If there are any questions, let us know. Okay, so, uh, is it possible to make chain of request, uh, chain of request response? Just imagine you have three steps process. On steps one and two, you provide some details about credit application. On step three, you're requesting some status or documents for specific credit application ID, uh, which is uniquely, uh, which is unique every time. So depends on information you have sent in the bodies at steps one or two, you've got two different answers. You've got different answers. I don't know if this is a question. Uh, okay, it was quite a long question. Uh, yeah. Let me answer it. Uh, what about chaining requests? Uh, yes, definitely you can chain it and it's quite easy because uh, your application or maybe several application can interact with one instance uh, of Hoverfly simulating some data. Uh, what it will be look like? Uh, okay, you have um, maybe some sort of author authorization and so on. And at first, uh, first initial requ request will come to Hoverfly. 
it will match to some um, request response pair and uh, the hoverfly will send back the response that matched. If there is no match, uh, it will not send anything. Or we can uh, program hoverfly to send some bulk response like code uh, 400 to respond to this sort of question. Uh, in case there is data that uh, is uh, changing uh, in your requests, uh, I've mentioned that you can use uh, various uh, matchers. Um, it's some sort of uh, syntax for your uh, requests to match them. And uh, in case you have some ID or some information in it, it will be a separate uh, field in this JSON file. And you can um, place some maybe a regex matcher, JSON matcher, you can uh, modify it somehow uh, that will apply to several cases uh, that uh, vary from time to time. And it will uh, respond with uh, some uh, request to your application. And actually you can um, insert some information you actually need uh, finally in your application uh, with uh, maybe middleware. You are asking about some complicated cases and uh, I would suggest uh, you to reach uh, documentation and there are also other mods uh, for Hoverfly I have not uh, talked about like spy mod um, and an another one so I don't remember but, uh, l uh, right now. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your presentation. It was okay. something uh, like uh, an insightful presentation for me. Um, uh, on the start, uh, could I uh, just download this uh, Hoverfly application and uh, do some adjustment? Uh, not from GitHub, just like uh, on Play Market or something. And uh, the next question is, uh, based on the contract testing, uh, could I use uh, this uh, uh, Hoverfly powers with NASA tools um, combined, maybe Postman, Swagger, or NASA tools? Yeah, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> because it's uh, a standalone application, it's out of service. Uh, you can install it on your computer. It's uh, free software. Um, but I don't think it's in uh, some sort of uh, stores like Play Market and, mm -hmm. uh, and so on, Windows Store. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's uh, there, but mm -hmm. you can download uh, you know, executable file that will mm -hmm. install uh, this on your computer. Mm -hmm. I even think that you don't need a uh, complete installation, it's just uh, about unpacking this application on your computer and uh, then you can interact with it. Mm -hmm. it, ha it has uh, great starting manuals, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, interacting with uh, uh, Curl. So you launch, uh, launch Hoverfly on some port, it's proxy or web server, and you can interact with it uh, from uh, your command line, and uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, I Could I use with this uh, in us uh, tools combined, maybe um, use, uh, based on this uh, contractor testing with Postman, Swagger, and other stuff? Huh. I actually have no experience uh, using uh, another tools with it. Uh, um, you know, Postman is like like uh, something about uh, user interface uh, testing uh, APIs and so on. Uh, why do you need uh, to match them? <laughs> Uh, we do have situations with our test cases when uh, we should have um, a simple request uh, to some um, source mm -hmm. and uh, after that you should have uh, um, specific uh, response from that source and uh, in that case uh, okay. it's more suitable to have more maybe um, pretty uh, format uh, presentation of uh, the response mm -hmm. like this. Okay, uh, you do not have to 
maybe do something special but for your uh, for your situation i would recommend uh, to go through documentation uh, some starting documentation and to understand uh, what is the uh, purpose of hoverfly in your uh, particular case mm -hmm. so it has various modes maybe you'll need something extra extra that mm, i presented mm -hmm. here Something like, uh, like extended version? Uh, no, 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 not extended version, but another mode. Mm -hmm. Like uh, there is some, okay, diff mode uh, in Hoverfly that helps uh, to make some testing, uh, contract testing maybe. Uh, you have, uh, Hoverfly actually um, returns to you some um, response compared uh, okay it returns diff do, do you know what's yeah, diff? Yeah, diff it, it retin returns difference between actual and expected result so you can handle it in your testing framework or by your hands okay thank you okay. any other questions or are they finish okay thank you uh i believe that's all Welcome everybody, welcome to the QA Winterfest, to Grid Dynamics, to Belgrade, Serbia. Uh, I'm going to talk today, this is last speech, after that we have food and everything. So uh, there was lots of talks, questions for the previous ones, so I'll, I'll try to speed up now. How to write great test scenarios? Uh, when we think about QA people, you know, Somebody says you know, they have to be like good detectives, you know, to investigate things. They have to be also like, in some sense, doctors in the, uh, in the emergency rooms. Now you're claiming they also have to be writers, so yeah, no pressure. But you have to have lots of skills to be good QA. About me, uh, starting programming a long time ago on a ZX Spectrum. If you Google, you can see that cute picture, how that looks like. Uh, my first job was in Mikhailo Pupin Institute in Belgrade here uh, when I worked on some very complex uh, projects and I with great people and acquired lots of my initial skills there. Uh, another thing mentioning, I worked for Nokia for 10 years, again working with really the great company, great people and the coolest thing was I had always the best phones over there available. Uh, since 2011 I'm, fo I'm focusing on QA and test automation. I somehow entered that. Before that, I, I worked mostly as a de development, as a developer. I entered QA, and uh, since then, I'm actually quite happy and working in that area. And currently, I'm here in Grad Dynamics. This is my fourth year as a test automation engineer and also specialization lead. Agenda. I'm going to mention something about major challenges in software projects that we have. Then. I'm going to talk about tests as living documentation to the rescue. Uh, last year I had a speech about tests as living documentation, but dedicated to that. And some of you maybe already, if you looked, this may be a little bit uh, repeating. I try to keep that short, but I just do a little refresher to explain why do we need great uh, uh, test scenarios. Then I'm going to talk about uh, behavior-driven development, also related. To this and we are going to the main thing brief principles we are going to learn what's what is that what is that anybody here here from brief principles oh great okay good but it means it seems to be a good topic yeah something to learn uh, of writing scenarios that, that that give us some some guidelines how to create scenarios that will look good and then at the end, I'm going to actually apply that on a real scenario. I'm going to start with something really bad, apply all these principles and come to something that looks much better. And uh, of course, there will be also uh, uh, time for Q&A. Major challenge. Uh, like for the last, I don't know, when the program is started, 40, 50 years, this issue is still not solved. The process of eliciting requirements and communicating them to everyone involved. This famous and very cute project cartoon uh, illustrates what I think. You know, what customers 
explained that he wants, then how is what understood by business people, how architect designed, how programmer implemented. I really like this, what customer received. It shows all the creativity that we can do when we go to, to really provide something. And at the end, what customer wanted. And this comes because of the lack of communication. And we need to improve that still. The other things, like software design, uh, was very good project was made. We have uh, design patterns, uh, we have you know, uh, solid principles or other principles that we use and we use that, we create really great uh, software, good software that is easy to read, easy to maintain. We have great software tools, IDs, source code control, uh, uh, lots of tools that help us to be more efficient. And then agile processes come to the game uh, they, that also uh, improved significantly project management. And it also helps in communication, but didn't resolve completely. We still need to do a little bit more in that area. Uh, one of the things that, th uh, that I believe is the reason for this and misunderstanding is that we don't have, or major thing, let's put it that way, there may be some other, is that we don't have a usable single source of truth about the system that we are building. Specification is supposed to be that, but they are not, because they become obsolete. You know, some changes are done, people talk, I don't know, in the coffee breaks or something, and they do, they don't even update, or even if they say the specification is up updated, and that specification becomes obsolete, or even worse, incorrect. It's source of the confusion. Another potential for, for the single source of truth is source code itself, which is source of truth, but not usable because not many people can understand it. Only, only the developers and only if, if it's written properly. And here is what I claim, that if we create tests properly, then they can serve as that single source of truth. And they can be living documentation. They can be always up to date. If we have tests, tests we, we run all the time, every time we run the test. That's why they cannot become obsolete. And if we create them in a manner that everybody can understand, then the problem with source code is also solved. Then, uh, you know, business people, everybody involved can understand that, and we all can have one thing that we can rely on. In order to be that, they have to, we have to, we have to have in mind the, the goals when we are creating the test that we really want this to be used as documentation, not just, just the tests. We, don't, we want to create tests so that they, keep, they can be descriptive when we create them. Then uh, they also should enable collaboration between people. That means when we create tests, we should use business language, not just a computer science language. Anytime we use computer science, we are just scaring people, confusing people. And then they should support evolution of the product. Well, in other words, they should really be written the way that if something is changed, we don't need to, made, to modify a huge number of tests. We have to follow some principles then to keep them independent. And if some feature is modified, we will modify tests for that feature, but not all the tests. This is one uh, diagram that I like that kind of supports the idea that tests can become and can be used as requirements. Uh, and uh, yeah, Robert C. Martin and Grigory Melnik, they put this equivalence hypothesis that says that as formality increases, tests and requirements become indistinguishable. And at the limit, they are equivalent. So they don't have to be equivalent, but I think tests can, be, can serve as a good, very good documentation. Um, Behavior-driven development. Anybody here tried or is working in a project that is using behavior-driven development? Okay, okay, yeah, there is a number of people. Good, good. Uh, well, I, I know that many people, when I ask and they say, yes, we are using behavior-driven, you know, we are using like Cucumber or, I don't know, some tool, JBehave, and that, uh, but it doesn't work, they say, because it's supposed, business summary is supposed to read them, but they, they don't read, they don't like reading them. And 
uh, it's understandable. I mean, if you don't write the test so they can understand it, they will not read it. We have to improve that in order for that to be usable. And uh, three activities, when we do behavior driven development, it's not only automation. People all, all usually think about the, the, the automation when they think about VDD, about Cucumber, and that's really not, not the most important thing. Even more important is activities that uh, come before that, and that is uh, discovering. Uh, this is the, the phase when people get together uh, from all the disciplines. They build shared understanding of the system. They have to come to the same page. They have to start using the same language. Oops. Oh, I skipped. I was typing this. They have to uh, establish uh, uh, shared understanding of, of the system. And then, as a second part, comes formulation, which is actually the main topic of my speech. I'm going to talk about formulation. This is how we are going these examples to formulate into something that will be understandable by all the parties. And as I said, as a third step, automation that is just here to make them more efficient. Discovery phase, I already talked, is really about conversation, knowledge sharing, uh, making sure that we are all on the same page. And for that, you don't need tools. So in order to practice BDD, you don't really need tools. You don't need Cucumber. You don't need anything. You need to make sure you understand each other. Uh, and then uh, formulation, again, the topic that I'm going to talk, uh, is this process of turning uh, this shared understanding into business readable uh, specification. Concrete examples uh, are formulated. The most uh, widely used, almost standard, is Gherkin. Anybody who is familiar with the Gherkin or understand the Gherkin? Wow, that's cool. I'm happy with that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's quite simple language. It's not something that's not a programming language. You don't need to, you know, go to computer science to study that. It's a simple, but uh, it introduces the structures. It introduces uh, some rules. And when we use that properly, we can create quite uh, readable, understandable, good uh, test cases. And then they can become living documentation that people can rely on. And this is the main thing. I'm going to talk about the brief, this, these principles when we create our test cases, how to, how to create something that is easy to, easy to understand uh, and easy to maintain. And they are business language. Real data, just, this is accurate, just, just the first letters of this, of this uh, five topics, business language, real data, intention revealing, essentials, focused. And then the sixth principle is brief itself, has to be brief. I'm going to talk about each in the next slides. Uh, business language means that we should use the business language. That means we have to uh, talk to business people. We have to learn about what we are making. Uh, you know, we should, we should study the system that we are making. If this is a financial system, for example, we should, we should really study all the terms. You know, they have different kinds of, of accounts. Or if it is stock trading system, you know, they have all different types of tradings. It can be quite complicated, but we have to master them. We have to know what it does. Only then we can create good system and we can create tests that everybody can understand. And again, I'm going to uh, what Robert C. Martin, Uncle Bob says that uh, software project cannot be successful without development team becoming domain expert to some degree. You don't have to be really expert to work in that area, but to understand, yes. Real data is uh, about using real data when we are creating, and there will be example for this that will make more understandable, but in short, just avoid saying, you know, uh, you know, I'm using X, Y, Z. 
for something, you know, you want to specify the street name and you say street X, Y, Z, just through, use the real, real names, real information, what is normally used in, for that system. Intention revealing a very important principle. They're all important, but this one is <laughs> oh, really important. Uh, we should uh, uh, reveal intent of the test case. In other, ca in other words, uh, we, should not, uh, we should not talk about how something is done, that I should click on this, enter into this text box. All these details, they are not that uh, important for, for something to be understood, and something will not be understandable if we put too many details. We have to reveal the intention. And uh, just one example here, but during the uh, refactoring that we are going to do later, it will become much more clear. Instead of you know putting how to log in and providing all these steps, just simply say when Bob logs in. That's the essence of that thing. Essentials is uh, another uh, important. Uh, we should really illustrate. Ju just keep the essential things on you uh, when you're uh, writing your scenario. Anything that is not relevant to that, you can just simply uh, remove. And focused, yeah, another really important <laughs> principle. If you know for the solid principles in programming, it reminds me to this, uh, the first S that says simple responsibility, but this is also a similar thing. It says basically be focused, just test one rule. One test should test one single uh, <coughs> business, business rule or requirement. But having said that, I want to mention that there are situations when we can actually uh, test multiple rules, but there should be exceptions. And maybe in production, if you work in production, we test in production. We don't want to run many uh, small tests, and because if we run many small tests, they will repeat, we will repeat some things. And some things can be sensitive. You know, if you're rolling in production, you may be buying real things. <laughs> and, uh, you don't want to do that. You, in that case, it's okay to do one big test, even automate one big test that will, in one run, test many. But this is just a smock test. Here I'm talking more when we are testing on staging environments when we have full control. This principle, very important. And then brief, try to keep them five steps or fewer, if possible. Uh, and if you see that it's more than that, you probably should then apply some of these principles. And now we are going to applying. So again, I'm going to use, uh, uh, as I said, Gherkin language, Ger Gherkin syntax. And I start with some scenario and then we just go step by step to apply all these principles. This is one uh, and I titled a very bad scenario. Does it look familiar to somebody? This is why. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not this drastic. I, I put maybe I hit a little bit even, even uh, worse than, than uh, you know, it's, it's, it's usually in reality. But yeah, you can see something like this. And if you look, look at this, and uh, people read this, uh, you can recognize, you know, people can recognize. And it's not that it's not uh, readable at all. You can see that, you know, I have here, you know, some shop. So it could be some shopping, e-commerce site. No, add to cart, so I'm adding something to the cart. Uh, checkout, I'm doing some checkout. A cancel order, so it's e-commerce side that I'm doing some shopping and canceling at the end. But at first view, it's kind of scary and confusing. So we are going to apply each of these principles to this particular scenario. And here is the first one, to refactor scenario to use business language. I couldn't put, you know, everything in one, <laughs> so I just uh, I just go section by section here. Uh, in, in this first section of that one, it's it's clear that you know, here you have really to go and talk to business people and understand to be able to do this. So and it's talking about homepage. When I open the homepage, then I should see the homepage title, much clearer. And the second section is about. Uh, adding something to the cart. When I open products page, 
and I add product to the cart. And I, and I open the cart and I should see the product in the cart. Again, much clearer. And with the, 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 uh, the rest of this test, in the third section, it's about checkout. So when I go to checkout, I enter credit card, place order. I should see the order is placed. And the deluxe session about canceling the order. When I cancel the order, then I should see the order is canceled successfully. And now, after this restructuring, this is how it looks. Somebody would be really happy. I think it looks already much better. It's much easier to read. Uh, and the business people may be even happy with this. <laughs> but we can do even better. Let's apply this F focus principle. And that means we want to illustrate a single rule. In that scenario, you're testing too much in one single scenario. That introduced dependencies and just not, 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 not very clear to read. How we do that? To identify the business rules, we should look at the then statements in our, I don't know, this somehow get moved, but we should look in our then statements in our, and usually one then statement is one rule. So here, I actually testing the four different rules, and I should I have some I should somehow identify that. What I'm going to do is, for the first two lines, I'm going to create another scenario. User can open home page. When I open the home page, then I should see the home page title. It's very basic scenario. Candidate for a smoke test. Whatever you do, you just you have to have this one. But not the rest. The second section, user can add an item to the cart. OK, here I still have to open the home page. But then I open the product page and I add to the car cart. Again, this is a scenario that is just testing that particular business rule. And I can, in scenario, name that to become really clear. That's about it. And then the third section, the third end clause, is about placing order using credit card. Uh, I create new scenario and just provide steps that are needed for that. And then the fourth one, canceling order. And again, uh, here I, I see all the rules that I'm testing here. I created four tests. Each of these tests is now doing just one thing. And here is how it looks, focus scenarios. We started with that, now we have four scenarios, each of them. And they can serve as documentation. Now, if we approach our colleagues from the business, business analyst, and we show them something like this, well, I, I believe they would, be, they would read that already. But we can do even better. Applying intention revealing principle. And this is now, uh, we want to describe what, not how. We still have in, in, the, in this test, although they look easier to read and everything, but they still uh, have something that is not, not quite clear. Intentional revealing means what, not how. Still we have here actions, too many actions. I open home page. I open the products page. I add item to the shopping page, which is not relevant for placing. I mean, uh, you have to have, uh, you have to have a shopping bag or card, but you don't really, for this particular scenario, you, had, you can assume that you have that. Instead of describing how we need, we should specify what do we need. And in the following example, in the following slides, I'm going to show one by one. So in the first case, you know, given I open the home page and I open the product page, that says how, but I need, given I have the product page open, this is what I need for this particular scenario. And then I will continue with the necessary step for that scenario. And the same for the, the, re, for the other uh, two scenarios. You know, instead of describing all this, I just have a little prerequisite. Given I have shopping bag with items, that's all I need. And then it makes them shorter. I'm going to the goal that they are also brief, which means they, have, should, they should have five or less. Uh, 
lines. And then the last one, even more drastic. No. All I need for cancelling, I need to have order. I don't care how I get it, but I need to have order. And then I will do steps to cancel it, to check cancelling action. Now, not only that this is now more clear, but this place, given I placed an order, I don't really need to do through the UI. I can do that by manipulating database directly. So this can be actually a really fast test. Or using the services, I can create these steps. So, so I can create this step to be really, really fast. And that will speed up this test. It will make it almost as fast. You know, initial one was faster than running four of them in, in the sequence. But now, when I'm speeding up this, it could be that this four will run almost the same time as the initial one. And also, uh, important thing, uh, this test, if placing order fails, then this test will fail too. But it doesn't have to. If I, if I implement this part uh, manipulating database directly, and not UI, then I will be good. I still can t this test will still pass, although there are problems placing the order. So that makes independence and, and more, uh, uh, more efficient. And we can see clearly if something fails, wait, where it fails. Not that we have to do some detective work. Now, uh, this is how they look with the good intentions. Uh, they are getting smaller and even easier to understand. And I, now I'm going to do... So, so far I applied three principles, B, I, and F. Okay. This is to, to reach this point that looks already quite good. Sometimes you don't need to apply all of them. Maybe you're already good with some principles and after applying three you will be quite okay. Uh, going to essentials, I, don't, I want to remove something that is not really important. And in this particular uh, test, I have the last step. This is test for, I want to place order using credit card, but I still kept and it should be possible to cancel order. Well, for this particular test, that's not important. It can just fail unnecessary if it's not possible to cancel order. But this test should not test that. I have another test for canceling order. And that one will catch that. I will not lose that. But this, it is too much. And also, uh, if you look at the credit card info, I, I provide all the details here, everything, which in some sense is good, but imagine that I use the same credit card in many different tests. And what will happen? I don't know. I have to change expiration date, which we have to eventually change. Then I will have to go and modify all of them. So it's better to, to keep that, you know, uh, to say I, I want to enter Visa and this step inside will implement the details about credit cards. Now, if I, if I want to modify the, the, the uh, expiration date, I will have to do that only in one place. Okay, now with essential Sony, that looks really, I think, yeah, five or less. Even, even, even brief principle is satisfied at this moment. Example for real data, okay. I didn't have example for real because I'm already done. <laughs> I didn't have any real data, but I put another example here. Imagine that we have like Stack Overflow or some Q&A. Uh, Q and A site, and you know we have you have test uh, when you say I when I ask question test question A B C. You know, better ask some real question. How can I write great test scenarios or whatever you need? Always use the real the real uh, data. And here is what we achieved. We see the starting point, and these four tests. Much easier to read. Uh, describe the, 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 they can serve as a documentation. I'm pretty sure business people will be happy to, to read this. It will not be difficult for them. Uh, we can run them in parallel. And what I said, implementing some, given I placed an order, we can make this really fast. All this given, we can, we can have really fast. Uh, so they can be even, if you run them and run in parallel, they could be much faster than executing a single one this here. Summary. 
Uh, miscommunication and misunderstanding of the requirements are still major problem in software projects since the beginning, I guess. We have somehow to solve that. And I, I strongly believe that what I mentioned here is the, really the step in the right direction. Not only just these brief principles, this is what is missing. I had my speech, as I said, a year ago, when I, I, I think, I hope, I, I build the case that it's important. But th the purpose of this is to really, how to create these good scenarios that business people will read. Then tests can, serve, uh, tests can serve as a single source. Uh, and they need to be written in a manner that all parties can easily understand. That's, that's so important. And BDD and brief principles help us create such tests. Now, I want to ask a question, and there will be prize. We'll bring. And that is, if anybody can tell me, it doesn't have to be exact, and I will help you, what this brief stands for, the principles. <laughs> ah, you, but you already said that you heard that. Uh, OK. You are my friend. You're, you're not. <laughs> I will help you. Try, okay. You can go in pairs or in groups, but then you have to share somehow the price. B? Business language. Okay, that's one is easy. I? Uh, R? Real data. I? Intention. E? Essentials. F? Okay, I, I heard two. Okay, this gentleman here, I see that you Say everything, and, but uh, somebody from here also. Yeah. Okay, and you. So I don't know how. Is it okay? Do we have two or just one price? Okay, then these two prices. I will give it. Okay. One for you. Great. <laughs> For you. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe I'll give you another one because. Uh, just brief about reference. All, all that I talk here, you know, if you're taking the notes or, or pictures, uh, actually, if all, all of this I get from the first book, these two books, Discovery, written by Gaspar Nagy and Seb Rose, great guys. And formulation, actually, that's the main that I got all these examples. You will find them there too. So if you, if you, uh, these two books, they will provide most of what I presented here. I also put some uh, great books that I read or uh, references, writing great specification, and specification by example by Gojko Ajic. That is the guy that actually kind of, when I read his books and everything convinced me about the importance of everything that I talked today. And test as living documentation is just uh, my presentation from last year. I referred that, so I thought I'll put that here too. Q&A. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The food is here. <laughs> but still time for Q. I don't know. Do we have time? Yes, please. Um, it's a kind of a general question. Uh, how to avoid um, cases getting convoluted if we have that simple form and we try to keep it as such, but we have many specifics. So the given may have its specifics when, its specifics then, its specifics, but we try to keep it the, the brief principle, okay. but uh, then we then we can have a million givens. That would <laughs> yeah, be, yeah. yeah. But yeah. still, we should then have you know, and and yeah. and, and and we try to avoid that. How I, to I, best I, summarize? Uh, yeah, I think uh, again, those are the principles. We need more principles, <laughs> but and we still. I, I think one idea is when you create your given, you put some uh, arguments that you can pass yeah. to that given, and then. You will just provide, you know, given I place order, you know, with credit card and uh, uh, this country and I don't know, but I will put different and this type of order, order of type, I don't know, same day order or regular order. 
So we can put it as, as, a, as a, uh, parameters into that step. Yeah. And then implementation of the step, then we'll have the trouble how to deal with that. But that is, that then this is a computer science issue that we kind yeah. of solve, should solve with you. Uh, so to summarize, we should keep the test itself as brief as possible for the principle and then uh, use our codes to cover as many specifics as possible. Yeah, so exactly. we should keep it, if a business person reads it, they will maybe not see as many cases as possible, but our code will cover it. But should there be a case for the business person to see that we are in fact covering as many different accounts, many different um, possibilities, so should we keep the case as vague, brief but, as possible, yeah, but, and uh, okay, have they, they all the specifics it, for the they, technical side? Okay, we, we cannot avoid of them seeing that, because this, those are requirements. Yeah. But they will not be, like, we are not going to implement many, if I understand, this, the question is great, but yeah. if I understand correctly, the problem is how we can have really lots of given, 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 given. I'm saying we should use parameter, parameters there, but then in, uh, in Gherkin, we have examples. And the examples, you can have hundreds of rows, you know, where there will be different types of, uh, we cannot avoid that, because yeah. they actually, those are the business, uh, uh, rules that we, we have to cover or we should cover. And again, you. we don't have to cover everything. You know. it's, it's really a great question. It's something that uh, is a problem, uh, you know, and uh, yeah, probably it's a topic for somebody to actually think about that and, and, uh, and pr they give speech on that. So next Thanks. Time. Thank you very much. Jovana. Uh, okay, I'm very loud. No, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, one question. Uh, how is this principle, uh, uh, is it good for end-to-end -end testing? End-to-end -end testing is basically when we have a huge scenario that we want to test in our test case and uh, large steps, how is this can be uh, used for that kind of scenarios? Uh, and okay, how? Yeah. I thank you. No, this, all of this is for end-to-end -end scenarios. All these for end-to-end scenarios. And, but I, I said, sometimes, especially in production system, we are not going to apply all of them, especially not one that, is, that says focused. It doesn't have to be focused. If it is, if it is in production and we, we may test, we don't have to apply all of them in, in some situation. But if you are, if you are doing uh, testing in, in a, a staging environment or some testing environment, then there is no excuse not to apply all of this and to have really focus scenarios. You should not have scenarios that test more than one uh, rule in, in testing environment. I'm not sure, okay. Uh, could you recommend some good uh, tools for writing test scenarios? Good tools for writing test scenarios? Yes. Uh, well, you know, the, 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 the tools that we, that we use for programming, uh, like uh, Justice K, any, any editor, like Visual Studio Code, or, uh, or uh, uh, I just forgot the name, escaped from my mind, but any, uh, many, many IDEs that do have actually support for Gherkin uh, syntax, and they can highlight, and even when you create, when you create uh, your Gherkin steps, you can actually go inside of the step, it, uh, it, uh, it, it just go right to the implementation of that step. So, so basically programming editors are good for creating at, at this level. Okay, so there. for automation, but for manual tests? D the same, why not? We can, as, as manual tests, actually good that you ask, uh, mention manual tests, I think uh, uh, obtaining this kind of skills to, to, to apply these brief principles, uh, everything would be really great for manual testing to become really good. Uh, you know, instead of going into automation, maybe you go into becoming great writer of the test scenarios. Uh, and that will be, I think, very valuable skill for the years to come <laughs> when somebody became uh, really good in that and can talk easily to the business people and then transfer that into very good uh, uh, 
uh, very good test cases that manual description just. But we can use, I, I know, I, I used, uh, every time I start uh, creating uh, test scenarios for some particular feature, I do that in test editor and I create manual test cases first. And eventually then automate them later if I have time, if there is need or everything. But I do create manual test cases using the Gherkin syntax too. I have one question. Um, so basically, uh, using uh, Gherkin and uh, Cucumber doesn't need to be mandatory if we follow these uh, principles. If, uh, for example, the class names and uh, method names are descriptive enough and the code architecture of the framework that we are building allows it, are there any real benefits to using Gherkin and, and Cucumber apart from um, maybe, I, I don't know, running the tests themselves. Yeah. Because if the framework uh, methods and classes are descriptive enough and, you know, ordered in a certain way, yeah. I don't see the... You are absolutely right, 100%. I mean, I, I can just say, <laughs> I agree. Gherkin is one syntax, and I mentioned that. It could be other, but, you know, you can write uh, great test scenarios using straight in Java if you provide good names. Uh, why not? It's not... Uh, about uh, really tools, but about, but you have to be more disciplined, let's put it this way. You know, if, if you use Gertig, it introduces some kind of discipline. It, it guides you. But if you use some other tools, then you can achieve that, of course, but you have to introduce a little bit more self-discipline or how to do that. Thank That's you. my view on that. Good question. Hey, so uh, are there any testing frameworks or programming languages Gherkin would not be compatible with that um, you would avoid using it? Or any testing type you would avoid using it? Okay, yeah. To be honest, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I know that they support definitely you know, Java, Python, Ruby, C Sharp, there is Spec Flow. Uh, there are many languages that support. Is there some that don't? Probably, must be, but I don't know. Really, haven't, I didn't do any thorough investigation of that. Thank you. But if there is, I guess there, is, there can always be people that can provide support even for that language, if you have a need. Uh, there is an online question, which is, in Agile with Automation, there is uh, this idea that business people could write test steps and then we should just copy paste and implement the steps. Can you talk about this misconception? Uh, it is kind of a kind of in contradiction with this brief principle. Do you want me to repeat? Well, no, I understand. Uh, I'm just trying to say why it would be contradiction. Um, if uh, business people are capable, if they know brief principles, why not? They can use that too, if I understand correctly the question. But uh, in general, I think, uh, talking about BDD, or behavior data development and discovery phase, uh, BDD have to somehow transfer their understanding of the, of the system to other parties, to developers, QAs. And this conversation is something that is really, really important. If uh, business people just write that, then uh, we are using just one brain. We are not using two or three or four brains. And two or three or four brains will always do a better job than one brain. That's why I think it's important to have this discussion and, uh, and conversation about things. Just, just to build, there's all four brains to have the same understanding about the thing. That's, that's important. And I would say the question is, it's not against big principles, it's against BDD to do that that way. That's how I, if I understood correctly the question, what I would say. Okay, hopefully that was heard because it stopped for a second. Uh, there is one more thing. Uh, can, you uh, can, can you go back once more to the slide with this uh, brief principles, please, if possible? Okay. Oh, yeah. that's that. I, I think that cool. was it. Yeah, yeah. Here it is. Oh, yeah. I didn't want to go there because I had question about it. Yeah. <laughs> Alana says, thanks a million. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's it. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I have a question more about the context of the project. Uh, I believe... Uh, BDD will be a great solution for such projects where we have many manual testers and uh, half or less uh, engineers who are automation engineers. But how do you think uh, would be BDD would would be useful uh, implementing uh, BDD framework to such projects where 
uh, all engineers uh, are automation engineers. Oh, very useful. <laughs> very useful. It's <laughs> essential for that too. Uh, as I said, BDD is not about uh, uh, is not much about uh, uh, understanding the 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 test case scenario. It's about building uh, shared understanding, same understanding between business people and development. And even if you have all the development, they still have to have think the same. What business, when business says, I want to do that, you want to make sure that you understand that proper way. Not that picture, you know, that a customer says, I want this, but you build something totally different. And BDD is about that, not about ability to read the code. Yes. If you have all the uh, people that know development, that do automation, they can create test cases that are just automation, but they're just for them. The important thing is, do they still have the same understanding like business people? And we have to build that. And to build that, you have to make it understandable for business people. Cool, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's very good. Thank you. I was told, uh, I don't know, I was told uh, you are supposed to get some phrase. There was something in all our presentations. This is how you go. And also, I want to say, yeah, I think the, we will still be around, myself, my colleagues uh, that uh, did other presentation, my other colleagues from the Grid Dynamics. So please stay around. There is also some food refreshment. And we can talk a little bit more. Thank you.